morning, everyone. In the Mishnah Behira, <clears throat> if you turn to page 519, it's a summary of that which we learned in per the second part of Perik Bays. <clears throat> the second part of Perik Bays is Nogea, the halachas of Shemitah, and it's also Nogea, the halachas of Meiser. Peros, fruits of a tree, for first example, as we mentioned, grow in different years. They blossom in one year, they may be picked in another year. Vegetables, on the other hand, mature in one year, they may be picked in another year. And because we're dealing with different years, we have different rules. Uh, something for uh, this year is the sixth year. If something is considered a sixth year fruit or a sixth year vegetable, then it's Mycerician and Mycer honey. If it's a fifth year fruit or vegetable, it's Mycerician and Mycer shani. If we move between the sixth and the seventh year, if it's sixth year fruit, it belongs to you, it has no Kedusha Shvias. If it's seventh year fruit or vegetables, it's Kedusha Shvias and doesn't belong to you. So how do we determine whether it's fifth year, sixth year, or sixth year, seventh year? So on page 519, we have a summation of that which we learned. These um, charts in the back of the Mishnah Behiva are excellent reviews as you go through different topics in Masech the Shavias. It gives you a basic, basic review. So at the top of page 519, Haklal, <clears throat> the rule. Uh, the simple rule is fruits that grow, and then we have to define grow, they become Kedusha Shviyas beginning Rosh Hashanah of the seventh year. Haklal, Tzmochem Shegidula Mismashech Al Pnei Hashonim Hashishish Vahashviyas, O Al Pnei Hashonim Hashviyas Vahashminas, fruits that grow, quote unquote, between six and seven, or between seven and eight, present particular Shemitah problems. You can have the same problem seven and eight. Uh, is it seventh year fruit, Kedusha Shviyas? Is it eighth year fruit, not Kedusha Shviyas? Yesh lav mesuyam begidulam hakove eshnas yishtayuhusa. There is a specific point of reference, uh, depending on a fruit, vegetable, etc., that is koveya, that establishes the year in which the fruit or the vegetable is shayach to. It's a six-year fruit, a seven-year fruit, a seven-year fruit, an eight-year fruit, a fifth-year fruit, a six-year fruit. Skip to the next box. The peros ha'ilam. How do we determine fruits of a tree? Are they fifth or sixth year, sixth, seventh year, seventh or eighth year? Chanota. One word you have to remember, fruits of a tree, chanota, when they blossom. Well, how, when do they blossom? Larambam havosh lish. The Rambam says when a fruit has is is grown one third of its full growth, that's chanota, which means that a fruit that you have a pomegranate tree and it ripens to one third of its size in the fifth year, and then it finished the ripening process in the sixth year, and you pick it in the sixth year, that fruit is fifth year fruit irrespective of whether it continued to blossom in the sixth year, irrespective of the fact that you picked it in the sixth year, the point is it grew to one third of its full growth in the fifth year, and therefore it's fifth year fruit. That's the Ramam's definition of Hanata. We're on part, page 519. Letosvis, however, according to Tosvis, Smodar. Smodar is defined as the point where a fruit has gotten to the point where its protective leaf that grows usually on it or around it has fallen down, and now the fruit is exposed. That's considered chanata. Either way, whatever definition you give to chanata, that's the point that determines whether the fruit is 50 year, 60 year, 60 year, 70 year, 70 year, 8 year. So this halacha is nogea meiser, and it's also nogea shmita. Skipping to the next. Uh, bold words. 
Bitrua Uvazesim. When you're dealing with grains and olives, they have a rule of Hava Shlish Gidel. That's clear. It uh, depends on when it grew one third. So if you have an olive tree and the olives on the tree have ripened to one third of their growth and they ripen to one, year, one third of their growth now, the sixth year, the fact that they are going to continue on the tree into the seventh year and you pick them in the seventh year is immaterial. They are not Shavia's fruits. They are sixth year fruits. Now, because they're sixth year fruits, Bear in mind that now you have to take off Meiser Rishon and Meiser Oni. Uh, we're going to learn later, fruits of the seventh year, Shemitah, there's no Truma and there's no Meiser. It's not, it, uh, the seven year cycle is year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, the, the Meiser. Year seven, there's really no Meiser. So what you pick in the seventh year that is Kedusha Shvias, you don't give Meiser on. But what you pick in the seventh year that blossomed in the sixth year is sixth year fruit. And therefore, there's still Meiser Rishon and Meiser Oni. When you're talking about an olive tree, or you're talking about grain, but many people do have olive trees. If you're talking about an olive tree, if the fruit of, if the, fruit of the tree, the olives, have ripened to the point of one third of their growth during this year, the fact that they stay on the tree after Rosh Hashanah, and they get picked then in the seventh year, they are not seventh year Kedusha Shavias olives. They are sixth year olives, which require you to take off my Serishan and my Sephani. Next rule, back to the chart. The Biarakos, when you're dealing with vegetables, Lakita. It depends when you actually pick it. So you have potatoes that popped out of the ground in the sixth year, and you don't pull them out of the ground until the seventh year, those potatoes have Kedusha Shavias because they were picked in the seventh year, irrespective of the fact that they fully matured in the sixth year. Next rule, but Orez, remember we learned the four quote unquote exception, Orez, rice, dochen, millet, pragim, poppy, shumshumen, sesame, hashrosha. That depends upon when the seeds took root. And we explain then the problem with poppy and sesame, millet, and rice. We need a common point in the development of a fruit or vegetable to say this is the cutoff point. So vegetables generally, up, you plant vegetables, they generally mature at the same time. You plant a whole field of potatoes, they'll generally mature at the same time and uh, we the the chazal will covea that the irrespective of whether they all matured at the same time or didn't mature at the same time the point that's common between vegetables is picking them so then we know that you're picking the same fruit of the same year in other words as we learned in year one and year two, the Meiser doesn't change. Year one, Meiser Rishin, Meiser Shani. Year two, Meiser Rishin, Meiser Shani. But you can't wait two years to take off your Meiser. Meaning, a person picks <clears throat> his pomegranates in year one and picks his pomegranates in year two, mixes them all together and says, there's no big difference because year one and year two is Meiser Rishin, Meiser Shani. I'm just going to take off a bunch of pomegranates for both years. You're not allowed to do that. The Chazal are now from a Pasuk that the fruits that, uh, that, that blossomed in year one, you have to take off Meiser separately from those that blossomed year two. But the Meiser is the, the same. It's true it's the same. But the Meiser has to be taken off for that which blossomed in year one separately from that which blossomed in year two. So we're looking for common points. Common points on a tree, a fruit tree, is when the fruit blossoms. Common point on vegetables is when it's picked. On these four items, rice, millet, poppy, 
sesame, even if you plant them at the same time, they generally mature all over the field at different times and they're gonna be picked at different times. So what, what will be the common denominator so that I, that I know which poppies are year one poppies and which poppies are year two poppies? The common denominator used by Hazal is Hash Russia. When the seed took root in the ground, that means that they're all of the same year. So however you determine hash Russia, if you plant the poppies, doesn't make a difference. You can pick them, you pick some poppies in year one and pick some poppies in year two. If all those poppies took root in year one, they're all year one poppies. So those are the basic four uh, common denominator times. Peros or Elon, fruits of the tree, blossoming, uh, grain and olives, one third of growth, vegetables when you pick them, poppy, sesame, millet, rice when it took root. And then the rest of the chart talks about those exceptional cases, which we learned at the end of Peric Bays about certain types of vegetable fields where you stop watering them 30 days or 60 days or 90 days before Shemitah and they become, they get a separate new rule. That was the rule we learned and it's on the chart as well. Okay, let's now begin Perek Gimel. <clears throat> Perek Gimel is on page 414 of the Mishnah Behira. We mentioned several times that there are certain malachas that are biblically prohibited during Shemitah, and there are only four of those, parentheses a fifth. Everything else is only rabbinically prohibited. The five, the four that are prohibited uh, biblically are picking grapes, pruning the grape tree, the grape tree, um, planting. Let me get you the fourth one. Okay, one second. Planting, planting, pruning a grapevine, harvesting grain and picking grapes. Those are the only four biblically prohibited malachas. And then we put in there also plowing, uh, which has its own source. Anything else is prohibited rabbinically during Shemitah. On top of the rabbinical prohibition, Chazal were very concerned. This is a point that we talked about and now we're gonna see it in the Mishnah. Chazal were very concerned during Shemitah about Maris Ayin. Doing things that are really permitted, but somebody may get the wrong impression and think that you're doing something that is prohibited during Shemitah. And we don't want that. Maris Ayin. We don't want people to suspect that you're doing something that you're not allowed to do during Shemitah. And as we start reading this Mishnayis, we'll familiarize ourselves with why Chazal was so concerned dafka about Shemitah that someone is going to raise suspicions with other people. And the simple answer is Shemitah is one of the most public mitzvahs we do. Uh, we do a lot of mitzvahs. We go to shul, we put on a tefillin, but this is a public mitzvah fields. These are wide open fields. Everybody can see what's going on in someone else's field. And we need to have some sort of consistent enforcement, which we can very well appreciate today in Lo Aleinu, Hashem Yerachem, save us please, in the Corona days where people are doing things and they raise suspicions. Why isn't he wearing a mask? Well, maybe he already he had, maybe he already had corona. Maybe he didn't have corona in the old. You don't have to wear a mask. So maybe I don't have to wear a mask. Bechulu, bechulu. The Shemitah is of such a public nature. It is about everyone's field in Eretz Yisrael. Not in Eretz Yisrael was determined by agriculture. So when a couple of people start doing things that look like they're violating Shemitah, 
it sends a bad message to other people that they can do the same thing. And sure enough, before you know it, no one's keeping Shemitah. This is a very public mitzvah. It's out there in the, everybody can see what's going on. Chazal were very concerned to make sure there's a, a, an observance of Shemitah to the extent that we don't want anyone looking at anyone else's field and saying, he's doing that, then I can do it also. So this parrot is going to begin with a discussion of fertilizing a field. Fertilizing a field is not one of the four, quote, uh, parentheses, five malachas. It's not the planting, it's not the plowing, it's not the cutting, uh, pruning your grapevine. It's fertilizing. There's no pasuk in the Torah that says you can't fertilize your field during Shemitah. It's rabbinically prohibited. Now, in the olden days, the way that they used to fertilize a field was usually with cow manure. And the cows, if you take a look, uh, for example, at picture uh, four, uh, 63, on page 415, so you have a couple of cows or bulls, and they're inside their corral, and there's manure there. What the what people who own fields would do is they would eventually begin collecting the manure. They would shovel the manure out and create piles of it in the field at convenient places in the field. And as the year went on, they would take from the pile of manure and they would spread it around the field as necessary. And these piles are called ashpatot. They're piles, they're piles of manure. And as more and more manure was, uh, got, was uh, dropped in the animal corrals, so they would remove it from the corrals and create these piles in the larger fields. Definition one, ashpatot simply means a pile. So now the Mishnah asks, Perek Gimel, Mishnah Aleph, page 414. From what point of the year can you remove the manure and create stockpiles? Meaning, if you're going to do what you do during the 60 years of the cycle, you collect the manure, you bring it into your field. Why do you bring it into your field? It's a preparation to create piles, to spread the piles all over the field, to fertilize your field. Fertilizing, excuse me, fertilizing your field is prohibited mid rabana. But when a person starts stockpiling his manure in his fields, it really looks like he does, he's not keeping shavias. He's stockpiling the manure in the field because he's getting ready to spread it out in the whole field. Now, Chazal understood that you cannot continue a whole year with the manure obviously piling up in the corrals with the animals. It's not healthy for the animals. It's, it's simply an, an intolerable situation. You need to remove the manure and you need to stockpile it in the field. But if you stockpile in the field, people watching say, oh, he's stockpiling the manure because he's getting ready to fertilize the field. So how do we do this? So the Mishnah says, May Ema Saimot see it, it's a Valmash Pato. At what point in the year during Shemitah can I start bringing out from the corrals the manure and creating piles? So the Mishnah now says, and this will give you an idea of what Chazal we're dealing with. Mishiyifsiku Ovde Avoda Diver Reb Meir. Reb Meir says you can start stockpiling the manure in the field as soon as those people who are known to be Shavias violators, when those Shavias violators stop stockpiling their manure in the field, once you, there was some period of time known at that at, in those days, that this is the time that people that don't observe Shemitah, they stockpile the manure. Once that period of time ends, everyone, excuse me, is free to stockpile the manure because the Shavias, the violators, have finished their work. Now let's read the Rav on this, right? This sounds like a very strange rule. Chazala telling you you can do something once the Balei Avera are finished. 
but that's exactly what the Mishnah says. Let's take a look in the Rabbin page 414. Mishayifsiku ovre aveira. Lavod es ha'oretz b'shona hashviyas. When the, if you take a look at the Rav, in the bold words of the Rav, on the first of the wide lines, it says, Mishayifsiku ovre aveira. When the sinners stop. Our Mishnah on page 415 on the top line says, Ovde Avoda, the workers, the people who, who violate Shemitah by working in the field. Now, if you change the Dalit to a Rej, Ovde becomes Ovre, Avoda becomes Avera. So that was the Rav's Girsa in the Mishnah. Mishayivsegu Ovre Avera, when the sinners stop stockpiling the manure in the field, Everyone else is free to do it because then no one is going to look at you and say, you're also an Oivra Aveira because that period of time with the Oivra Aveira were busy stockpiling the manure and fertilizing the fields has passed. So now there's no Maris Ayin for the person who wants to observe Shariz. So the Rav says on page 414, but before the Ovre Aveira, those who do not respect Shavias and they violate Shavias, before that, while they're still violating Shavias and bringing out the stockpiles, also, you're prohibited. People shouldn't say, you also must be one of the sinners because you're stockpiling the manure during the time that the sinners who we know work their field, they are stockpiling the manure to work the field, and now you're one of them. So we wait till those kind of people are done. Okay, that's how sensitive Chazal were to this. We we're talking about a rabbinic prohibition of fertilizing the field. And nevertheless, even though it's of rabbinic nature, there is still a maris ayin. People will say he is not observing Shemitah because he's violating the rabbinic, the rabbinic prohibition of uh, fertilizing the field and he's going to work the field. That's Rebbe Mayer's position. Now, what is the exact date? I don't know, and I haven't seen anybody give a date, but this must have been something that was known. when the sinners who don't observe Shavias would, would be finished their stockpiling. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, page 14, 415, Rabbi Yehuda says, Mishivash HaMatok. Now we know Matok means sweet. Menur obviously is not sweet. Rabbi Yehuda calls Menur Matok sweet because fertilizing a field will produce sweet fruits. So he calls the manure matok, it's sweet. But Rabbi Yehuda says, Mishayivash hamatok. Once the manure becomes dry, then at that point you can pile it up in the fields. Why? Because once manure is dry, you can't use it for fertilizer, it has to be moist, otherwise it doesn't seep into the ground. So Rabbi Yehuda sheet is more definitive than the first sheet. The first sheet is when the sinners stop. Rabbi Yehuda has a definitive time. When the manure is dry, you can stockpile it in your field. Why? Because nobody's going to say you're doing it to fertilize your field. You can't fertilize your field with dry fertilizer. So then you're going to ask Akasha, so why is he piling it up in his field at all? You can't use it anymore. Ah, because eventually, when the rainy seasons come later, the rain will again soften up the manure, and again, it'll be used for fertilizer. But right now, it can't be used for fertilizer. People will not think that you're a sinner. And therefore, Rabbi Yudha says at that point, when it's dry, you can then bring it into the stockpile in the field. Rabbi Yossi, Omer Rabbi Yossi says, Mishii Kasher. Rabbi Yossi says, from the time the manure, it's very similar to Rabbi Yehuda Shita, from the time the manure sort of bonds together and becomes knotted together. The Mepharshim say Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi really are not arguing about much. It could be they're only arguing about a definition, 
how do you know what the point is? And one Rabbi Yehuda says, when it's drying, Rabbi Yossi says, when you see it's getting knotted. Okay, the point of this Mishnah for us is the concern that Chazal had about Maris Ayin, even on rabbinic prohibitions. We're not gonna spend a tremendous amount of time on these Mishnahis. Uh, it's only for the purpose of uh, getting an appreciation of Maris Ayin during Shemitah. And since a lot of us have gardens, and uh, as I mentioned so many times, the purpose of Shemitah is not that Rabbi Shalom wants Eretz Yisrael to look ugly. It's not because he wants all the trees to die, and he wants all the plants to die, and he wants all the fruits to die, Chas Shalom. But <clears throat> the purpose in the Shemitah is to create a year in which everyone can eat from the fruits, so to speak. We'll get to Taimei Shavias at a later date. But Chazal were very concerned. To, they, they didn't want anything to have to be damaged in the field. They didn't want the fields to die. But at the same time, they needed to enforce certain rules. And in the enforcement of these rules, they were very sensitive to Maris Ayin. So the people that have gardens uh, today, you have trees, you have fruits, you have flowers, you have all kinds of things growing. You don't want them to die and you need to do things to keep them going in Shemitah. You can't shut off uh, your computer system that waters your trees and waters your plant and waters everything that's and it's gonna die. Um, you have to consult with a from gardener and with a Rav. At what settings can you put your computer during Shavias? But you do not have to shut the whole thing off so that everything dies. At the same time, you need to be sensitive to when you go into your garden and you're going to be doing things in your garden or your gardener is going to be doing things in your garden. You have to make sure it's okay in halacha and it's not. there's no issue of maris ayin that people will say, hey, look what Ruben's doing in his garden. This was a very sensitive issue to Chazal. Mishnah Beis, page 416. Ad kama Mishnah Aleph taught us that you, at some point in time, you can begin to stockpile manure in your field. Now the question becomes, how much can you put in the field without it looking like you're really in the process of uh, preparing the field for fertilization? So this Mishnah is now talking about the time that it's permitted. In other words, Mishnah Aleph said, Let's take, for example, Reb Yehuda. Reb Yehuda said that when the manure hardens, at that point, you can then stockpile it. Before that, you can't, because it looks like you're fertilizing the field. Now the Mishnah takes the next step. After the manure has hardened, and therefore there's no real Maris Ayin, is there a limit to how much you can stockpile even when you're permitted to stockpile? And the answer is yes, because if you begin stockpiling all over the field, many, many heaps of manure, it again looks like you are going to be fertilizing your field, even though it's dry. It dry here, dry there. If you do it in a way that you spread little piles of dry manure all over your field, it again looks like you're preparing for fertilizing the field. So the mission now is, I come as up when the time arrives that you're allowed to stockpile the manure, it could be according to the, the first opinion mission. It's after the violators stop. Reb Yehuda, it's after the manure has hardened, or Reb Yossi, after it's become knotted. After the point where you're allowed to stockpile, how much can you stockpile during the seventh year? At Sholosh, Sholosh, Ashpatot, one. Remember we learned about the base Sa'ah in Perek Aleph. A base Sa'ah is a field that's 50 amos by 50 amos, or 2,500 square amos. We learned about that when we talk about a field of fruit trees, when till when can you plow it? So the first part of the definition is in an area of a field that's 50 amos by 50 amos, you can put three piles there. If you took a, take a look at page 65 on page 416, it's showing you three piles 
in 50 amas by 50 amas, but that doesn't really tell me much. How much is allowed to be in each one of those three piles? Is there a minimum? Is there a maximum? So the Mishnah says, shall eser eser mashpelot, a mashpelot is the box that the farmers would use to um, move manure from the corral into the field. And uh, that's called a mashpela. Well, if that doesn't tell me anything yet, how big is each mashpela? Shalesech lesech. Each mashpela has to be the measurement of a lesech. So we have three piles. That's what you can do in the field. Three piles when it's permitted, after the point that it's permitted. Three piles. Each pile has to have at least, not, not it's allowed to have as a maximum. This is a minimum. Each one of the three piles must have in it no less than 10 boxes of manure. Each one of those boxes being a lesser. <clears throat> so each one of those piles has 10 lessers of manure. Altogether, you're talking about 30 lessers of manure. You want to add to the piles, you can add to the piles, but you can't have smaller piles. Why? The bigger the pile becomes, the more people realize it's just a stockpile. Nobody puts that big piles in a field if he's fertilizing right now. If you're fertilizing right now, you make small little piles all over your field for your convenience. You don't make a tremendous stockpile in one place and then you're gonna have to shovel it all over the place. That's double work. First stockpile it and then bring it all over the place. So the bigger the pile is, the more it's being stockpiled and people will not think that you're getting ready to fertilize the field. The smaller it becomes and the more piles you have around the field, it begins to look again like you're fertilizing the field. So the first definition is how much can you stockpile once it becomes permitted? Three piles in a bait uh, <clears throat> Each pile has 10 boxes of manure, how much is each box a lesser? So the Mishnah says, Mosifin al hamashpelos, this is what we just said. Each one of the three piles can have more boxes. It can have 20 boxes of manure. It can have 50 boxes of manure. You can add on to the minimum 10. You can't have nine boxes or eight boxes or seven boxes in each pile. The minimum is 10 boxes per pile, and you can add to the pile 15 boxes, 20 boxes. The bigger the pile, the more people realize it's a stockpile, it's not fertilizing the field. For ein mosif and al ha'ashpatot, however, you cannot add to the number of piles. Piles are only three piles in a bait, no more. But in those three piles, you can add more and more and more boxes. Reb Shimon Omer, Reb Shimon disagrees. And he says, Af al a person can also add additional piles. You don't have to have only three. You can have additional piles. We don't understand Reb Shimon as yet. We will not fully understand Reb Shimon until we learn Mishnah Gimel. Reb Shimon continues his shita in Mishnah Gimel. Melineda, we will take a look at that tomorrow. Again, we're going to go through some of these Mishnayas very quickly. We're just getting the idea about what you can do and what you can't do because of the sensitivity of what people looking on will think you're doing, that you're a violator of Shavias, and that's Maris Ayan. <clears throat>